Hello. In this uh, video lesson 5b, I will then discuss the optimal rate of uh, emissions tax. So previously I discussed the classification of uh, um, environmental policy instruments. And remember that uh, emissions tax or environmental tax is one of the uh, one of these kind of market-based instruments that could be used. But uh, then in this video lesson, I will dive into the question of, uh, of how large the tax should be and how to set this uh, um, tax at the, at the most uh, uh, optimal level. So I will think about, uh, for sake of simplicity, some kind of flow pollutant. And uh, in this figure, we, we think about the the how to set the optimal rate of emission. So I will spend some time discussing you with this uh, this uh, this particular figure, which is uh, seven point three in the in the permanent alt textbook. So here on this on this figure, we have on the um, horizontal axis. This m is the amount of um, amount of pollution, and then on the vertical axis uh, we have the monetary uh, benefits and, and, and damages. And we focus particularly on the marginal benefits and, uh, and marginal damages. And um, before we begin with this figure, it's maybe good to, good to remind that what type of pollutant we are, we are now thinking about. So of course, very much of the public discussion nowadays focuses on the, on the um, uh, global warming and the carbon dioxide emissions that are contributing to it, and uh, in many countries, like uh, like here in Finland, we have the this kind of net zero target that uh, that we would like to drive the uh, emissions of carbon dioxide or or greenhouse gas emissions overall to the to the net zero level. That there's uh, there is uh, there is. Um, uh, emissions are equal to the to the cap natural capture by by forests and perhaps also some kind of mechanical capture in the longer term. But uh, there are also many other type of pollutants where where there is also also this kind of natural absorption capacity. So maybe in this example, it is more helpful to think about, uh, uh, for example, um, nutrient emissions from the agriculture. So we think about uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. And importantly, there are some kind of marginal benefits. So here is this kind of downward uh, sloping curves. The, the higher one is marginal benefit before tax, and then the lower one is marginal benefit after tax. So it's important to recognize before we begin that there are some benefits from this uh, pollutant. And if you think about uh, nitrogen and phosphorus in agriculture, for example, so having uh, using some fertilizers gives nutrients to the to the to the plants in uh, in crop production. So without this kind of uh, fertilizers, uh, the agricultural output would be would be much smaller and uh, and uh, perhaps not uh, not necessarily enough to feed uh, feed the population. So definitely there is some, some benefits of using, using fertilizers. However, there is also, also damage because then, then uh, there can be runoff of these fertilizers to the water system, which causes then, uh, then um, for example, algae bloom, uh, eutrophication. So, so of course the nutrients as such are not harmful in the environment, but uh, but the excessive growth of then, for example, algae will will then uh, change the water systems and become causing also also then damage to different species, including humans. So this this is illustrated then with this kind of marginal damage curve, which is upward sloping. So it 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 is growing, and uh, and that means that of course that the damages. Uh, the total damages are growing very fast if the marginal damages are even even increasing. So then the the total damages is uh, are are uh, increasing at a very uh, highly increasing rate. So then this figure illustrates the principle that uh, that how what would be the the socially optimal optimal rate of damage. So so as I said, 
that uh, the question is not that th that should we drive this pollution to zero because then uh, that would then hurt us with this kind of uh, um, we, we would then then have uh, avoid the benefits of the pollution in this my example it was the uh, nutrients to to the ag agriculture so this kind of fertilizers that uh, help to get uh, higher agricultural yields so there are benefits but then there's also damages from this kind of uh, excess fertilizers that, that that will run off to the to the to the water systems so if you think about then like like the problem of uh, of a profit maximizing firm that sets marginal costs equal to uh, marginal revenues so here is very similar situation so you can think about the marginal benefit as the as sort of like marginal revenue from this kind of uh, fertilizers and then marginal damage, you could think of it as the, as the increasing marginal cost. And then it's easy to show that to, to maximize the societal uh, net benefit, then it is optimal to set the marginal benefit uh, before tax equal to the, to the marginal damage. So then this marginal benefit, marginal damage, they, they cross, then, 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 the, then in some sense, uh, this will be the optimal level of the of the pollutant. So this is how we get this M asteric, which is the optimal level of pollutant, and uh, and we can see then read on the vertical axis that uh, that this uh, mu asteric would be then this uh, this optimal level of tax, that how large the tax is per unit of uh, uh, per unit of pollutant, and then then you can see that because then this uh, um, a difference between marginal benefit before tax and marginal benefit after tax, the difference between these curves is just equal to this mu asteric. So in that sense, uh, from the perspective of individual polluter, in this case, for example, individual farmer, then after the tax, then the marginal benefit of, of uh, using the fertilizer would be lower. So, so of course, for the individual farmer, then this uh, marginal benefit after the tax is relevant uh, uh, relevant curve to follow so so they would continue to use the the fertilizer until marginal benefit is is uh, is is uh, greater than or equal to zero so at the zero then they stop uh, stop using the uh, fertilizer whereas without the tax then then they would follow this marginal benefit without tax or before tax they would go all the way to this m hat where where the marginal benefit is is uh, is equal to zero. So this is how uh, by setting this tax, then then uh, the government regulator can can um, can uh, sort of uh, in, help to internalize this this externality because there would be a price for the polluter to pay. They they will have to or they have incentive to reduce the the level of the pollution to the to the societally optimal level. So this this is a very nice illustration of the principle how the how the uh, optimal level of tax should be set at the point where the marginal benefit equals equals marginal damage. But then of course this also requires from the policymaker some kind of uh, understanding that how this marginal damage and how the marginal benefit curves would uh, would look like in order to be able to identify this this optimal level of course it's also possible that uh, do some kind of trial and error that uh, that uh, uh, introduce first some some perhaps a smaller tax and then then increase it gradually over time if if it is doesn't lead to the to the sufficient reduction immediately so so but uh, but uh, but of course, it would be would be helpful to have some kind of information about this. Uh, what is the uh, marginal damage and, and marginal benefit? So in the previous video lesson, I also mentioned the possibility of using a subsidy instead of tax. So then let's compare what would be this uh, differences between tax and subsidy and how that would then then uh, treat the polluting uh, firms or, or farmers or whatever in a different way. So we can use these uh, tools of, of welfare economics to understand the tax implications. And, uh, and uh, let's think about first the, the, how the tax will then, then uh, influence the situation. 
So notice that uh, that first of all, the total tax revenue can we can easily see in the picture that it would be the uh, unit uh, tax or this mu asterisk, which is this uh, tax per unit multiplied by the number of units. So it would be this m asterisk. So so the uh, size of the area that is between this uh, this uh, horizontal and vertical axis and this broken line at, at mu asterisk and broken line at m, m asterisk, the size of that um, rectangle would, would represent the total tax revenue. So there is then, then um, part of that, uh, that tax revenue could be used for compensating the, the damage. So, so the damage cost would be then the area which is indicated in this fig figure with S4 and S6. So this is this area that falls under this marginal damage curve until point uh, M asterisk. Okay. But then there is also this kind of additional surplus transfer from the firms to the government. And this is equal to the area of S3 and S5. So this is the area above this marginal damage curve uh, and uh, and uh, this broken broken line so therefore there is in some sense the firms that are subject to the emissions tax they have to pay more than uh, than uh, what is needed to compensate the, for this damage so that that sense government is is collecting additional tax uh, tax income from the from the firms and of course, uh, in the international competition, this can hurt the competitiveness of the of the domestic firms, and perhaps uh, there is then a shift of production to countries with the lower tax or, or or no tax whatsoever. This is referred to as a pollution haven hypothesis. So then, another possibility to achieve the same result actually would be instead of taxing the producers. Uh, there would be a possibility to to subsidize abatement, and this is then then uh, so suppose that the originally uh, these uh, producers are emitting uh, this M hat without without any tax. They they continue to uh, emit until marginal benefit uh, uh, is equal to zero. So instead of imposing a tax, then then. Uh, the government could do the alternative strategy and say, okay, we are sub subsidizing the, the abatement. So then the optimal level of subsidy would be also equal to mu asterisk, because if then, then um, if the government says that, okay, we, we give you a, a subsidy, which is equal to the mu asterisk per unit, then, uh, then the foregone, um, benefits uh, firms would 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 then uh, have incentive to to decrease production until this M asterisk, and then the government would have to pay total subsidy, which is can be seen in this figure as this total area of S S one plus S two. So in this case, subsidy scenario, then the government is paying the firms to decrease the the pollution. So in that sense, the there is like a transfer of income because if you think about this area S two, which is uh, which is below the marginal benefit curve, this could be this kind of uh, a true compensation for the for the abatement because there is this this will cover the cost of abatement for the for the for the polluters. But then there is this additional surplus generated, which is equal to S one, which could be then some kind of just uh, transfer of of surplus from the from the government to the firms. And uh, there are, of course, some kind of uh, uh, difficulties in this in this subsidy scenario. Of course, the firms would uh, would rather have a subsidy rather than uh, than uh, than a, a, an emission tax. That's 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 clearly the case. But then, of course, there can be the problem that uh, that uh, with this kind of additional subsidy can then uh, increase the profitability of the firms, and then therefore this. Uh, Firms and industry becomes more competitive, and as a result, then then uh, there can be uh, more demand and 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 greater greater production. So this is then referred to as this kind of rebound effect, because if you have also like like total output increases, then there can be also then 
resulting more emissions. And then, then perhaps the government needs to subsidize more to, to, to um, decrease the emissions. And of course, another difficulty is that, uh, that somehow the government needs to then raise this kind of uh, revenues in some other sector, perhaps, uh, so that so that they can subsidize abatement in this sector. So obviously, the government cannot afford to just subsidize every every industry without uh, without collecting the additional tax revenues for somewhere else. So then there will be then some kind of uh, distortionary effects in the in the other sectors of the economy, perhaps for the for the consumers. Uh, so perhaps then then uh, then it's also possible to to try to have some kind of um, a combination of taxes and subsidies. So, so for example, if the if the tax hurts the the industry too much, then then it would be possible to utilize some kind of uh, some kind of uh, scheme that, that that imposes a tax, but then also subsidizes, for example, uh, cleaner technology. And it's of course possible to also impose the tax for the for the, for the pollution. But then subsidize the the technology, for example, that they wouldn't be like uh, like competing. So, but this kind of also also income distribution uh, issues become very very relevant when when considering this kind of uh, uh, emissions taxes or 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 technology subsidies. So, in the next lesson, then I will I will talk about the tradable emission permit scheme. Thanks for your interest and see you next time.